After having covered uh, the more theoretical part of compositional data analysis, we'll have now a couple of examples illustrating um, how these methods can be used in both exploratory data analysis as well as statistical modeling with compositional data. The first example is an example that um, I found, um, which is quite nice, and also uh, geochemistry. But it's in that book I mentioned that written in 2006 and edited by uh, Pavlovsky. Uh, and uh, the first one we'll talk about is some exploratory uh, compositional data analysis, looking at how the sequence of um, calculating basic numerical summaries, as well as graphical summaries by means of Biplot, can get more, you can get more insight into the, the nature of the processes that are happening in uh, the formation of soils. So the goal would be indeed to explore and visualize variation in soil geochemistry and to explain those variations by means of processing. And when we're talking about soils, of course, uh, these are quite important uh, in terms of agriculture as well as other, uh, other uh, kind of um, societal impact. And so processes could be um, studying the influence of the bedrock, bedrock, the parent material on the soil, influence of pollution, of uh, geochemical processes that are taking place um, that are elements that are going into solution, coming out of solution, pH conditions, uh, the influence of biological material, etc. And so the way this is often done is by using major and minor oxides and uh, trace elements. So the first uh, table we look at is uh, centers of the composition. As you remember, this was the geometric means calculated uh, from the compositions. And so uh, we notice here we're dealing with um, three types of uh, soils, or three of, or say soils, or of three types of material, bed rocks. So we're serpentine, gabbro, and, and basalt. And of course, gabbro and basalt are, are similar. And so um, as a result, we notice the difference um, in the composition of, say, serpentine versus the other ones, and particularly um, in terms of the aluminum uh, oxide as well as the magnesium uh, oxide. So then we can look at uh, these were centers. So then we can look at variances. Uh, so now we're looking at center to log ratio variances as well as total variances. So we notice a higher variance in the serpentine uh, as a total versus say variances in the other, other two rocks. And again, that's because these are of course very similar. Um, we notice a number of things. First of all, a low variance in the iron oxides. So there's a, a low mobility of, these, uh, of this iron. And then we also have a uh, high variance, relatively high variance in calcium oxide and uh, potassium oxide. And so, for example, the uh, calcium oxide has a pretty high relative variance here, and that behavior can be attributed to sensitivity of, for example, cation uh, to weathering processes uh, that have protected, that have in particular in this case affected the serpentine uh, parent material. Uh, the, uh, again, the aluminum here, we see pretty low uh, variance in all groups, and so aluminum is also only mobilized in under particular pH conditions, and so that's uh, probably not what's happening here. The other one, uh, potassium, uh, we see again um, high uh, variance, and that has something to do, of course, because of its role of potassium in the, uh, the soil plant system and the reactions involved there. Okay, so after looking at uh, these total variances, we now have to look at uh, variation matrix for the major oxides here. So the very, very, very call that the variation matrix look at the log ratios. Uh, variance of log ratios uh, are put in these in, in this table. So uh, let me put on my pointer. Here will be the variance of log ratio between say aluminum and silica. For then of course we have um, the three uh, groups as well as the total. And so um, that is uh, what we see in this table. So what, what appears in this table is a number of things. First of all, if you look at the bottom here, uh, we see indeed that we have the highest uh, variances. And so for example, potassium oxide relative to magnesium oxide and calcium oxide um, are the highest. And again, that shows this high variability uh, in, in the degree to which cations are, are exchanged into the aqueous solution. The other thing that we notice on the lower side is that involving hydrous oxides, such as iron oxide, 
And there we see that the mobility is, is pretty low. We don't see much variation. And so that means that mobilization, again, has to do with these, um, these pH ranges that uh, within that would occur that are not present in the, in the soil system. OK, so now we have our first biplot of the major oxides. Um, and so in a biplot, we need to look at a number of things. First of all, uh, we could look at the, the variables involved, and this would be the major oxides. And we notice what we would need to look at in a biplot is uh, collinearity. And for example, one type of collinearity is between aluminum oxide, magnesium oxide, and iron oxide. And so we'll be looking at, uh, at these elements uh, in more detail. The other uh, thing we'd like to look at, um, for example, is uh, things that are orthogonal or at least are more dispersed, have larger angles. And so, for example, calcium oxide, magnesium oxide, aluminum oxide or potassium oxide, these are all sort of things that have higher angles um, between them. Then we can look at samples um, and grouping. And of course, uh, here we notice clear grouping, which have them to do with uh, the bedrock material. Uh, and what we notice there is that there is a much larger um, variance in this group. It's also what we saw in the uh, in the statistical summaries as compared to, say, the gabbro or the basalt group. And that's something uh, that then we'll have to investigate in terms of what's happening and why is that happening for that particular group. So based on that, um, we'll be looking at, we now look at uh, a few ternary diagrams. Uh, first one has to do with the um, elements or the oxides that, uh, that were collinear. So in this case, it would be iron oxide, magnesium oxide, uh, manganese oxide, and aluminum oxide. And so here we look at the centered oxide that allows us to zoom in a little bit in the variation of the sample. And so we notice is that a uh, clear trend. Um, we start from aluminum and we start decreasing it, then we see an increase in dispersion uh, of these elements. So we get more variability in the iron oxide and manganese oxide. And of course, we get a decrease in aluminum oxide. So that has to do, uh, that comes with often uh, with increasing clay content. And uh, the effect we see here is not just the bedrock material, otherwise everything would just be on a line, but also it could be due to the the redox conditions that are that are varying in these uh, soils. So that that will be for the collinear uh, subcomposition. For a more discriminating subcomposition, we're looking at magnesium, potassium, and aluminum oxide. And again, we see that indeed the serpentinitic group has uh, much higher magnesium uh, compared to the other group. And again, we see uh, this vertex going from potassium uh, decrease in potassium. We see um, Again, uh, that the, the both the the, the, the uh, gabbro and basaltic material um, show um, an increase in in terms of the aluminum and magnesium oxide. Similar analysis can be done now on trace elements, for example, nickel, chromium, cobalt, etc. And um, again, we see uh, this, uh, the table here will be the centers of the composition, and the table here below are the center log ratio variances. And um, again, we, we can do the usual analysis by looking at the, uh, the changes in uh, or the differences in globals, uh, which are high for nickel, chromium, and cobalt, and also to some extent uh, strontium. Uh, and also the center log ratio, for example, um, here in strontium, we see a high variance. And some of these are then again related to either weathering or to the variation of, of bedrock uh, material. We can make biplots uh, in the same sense as before, um, uh, looking at, um, again, we were looking at things that are collinear, for example, lead, copper, lithium here, or things that are very dispersed, such as uh, strontium, nickel, uh, chromium, and lithium. <laughs> On the right-hand side, we can have a combined uh, biplot. Uh, that's the biplot for uh, both the oxides and as well as the, uh, the trace elements. Okay, let's now look a little bit at principal components. Um, <clears throat> what we try to do here is to find linear relationships. And of course, when we think about linear relationships uh, or modeling linear relationships in a ternary diagram, it would not show up as linear. It would show up as some kind of uh, a curve here. And so, what is the expression of that curve 
Well, the way to, to study this is not to look at the expression of this curve, but to look at um, the uh, log ratios, such as in particular the isometric log ratios. Do a transformation of, the, of these data into a log ratio, and then studying linear relationship, hopefully we'll find linear relationship of these log ratios. And so here, this is just an example of a standard uh, interpretation of how this can be done. Um, for example, we can do take our matrix, um, uh, our, our basically we do, first of all, uh, do I, our ILR uh, log ratio calculations. Uh, that forms then this matrix uh, I, Y transpose Y. So Y contains the, um, the ILR ratios. Um, and we can calculate from that eigenvectors. Uh, eigenvectors, we form then a basis in that uh, ILR space. And, uh, and evidently we have D minus one of those, uh, so given that our composition is of size D. Uh, so then we can calculate, uh, so these are essentially um, eigenvectors that are calculated in ILR space. And so we'd like now to have eigenvectors that are in the original space, in the original composition. And so we'll do this uh, inverse ILR transformation on that vector, which gives us this vector A. So now what we have is we have uh, a way of writing a composition uh, as a function of mean plus uh, something uh, a variable t times uh, an eigenvector ai. And so here in this particular example, so that works out in, in terms of uh, closure forms like this, but this is just a simple, uh, the equivalent of this is the same in principal component analysis where we write uh, essentially uh, a vector as a mean plus um, a linear combination uh, with a uh, principal component vector. So when we do that in this example, then this works out to be uh, and this, this particular line. So what does that mean now for a particular case study? Uh, so here we're looking at uh, two examples um, of uh, ternary diagrams. One is uh, calcium, magnesium, and potassium, and the other is titanium, silica, and uh, aluminum. And so um, so again, we're looking at trends or linear uh, trends. And so if we look at, for example, doing principal component analysis, then uh, we can find the principal component trend here. That is this trend here, which again is a trend towards increasing or decreasing uh, with my pointer. Uh, a trend here, that's a trend uh, towards increasing or de uh, decreasing uh, potassium. And so again, uh, this is for a basalt. Um, recall that a basalt is basically a pyroxene, olivine, and feldspar. And so that would uh, indicate uh, whether or reactions of basaltic minerals, um, and particularly magnesium and calcium uh, mobilization, and again, increasing clay content. So we see uh, definitely a trend of increase and decrease in, in, in clay content. Uh, and similar into this, uh, this other one here, um, again, we can find, and we can look at the principal components. Uh, these are all calculated by ILR components, so ILR uh, log ratios. And so we see here, uh, that a decrease uh, would be a leaching of, uh, of silica uh, and, and, and an increase uh, of, of clay content. So again, um, we can use this, uh, essentially this analysis to look for relationships, trends uh, that are indicative of certain processes occurring in soils. The second example, we will return to the, uh, the Dickinson model. Um, uh, call it in a Dickens model, um, we're looking here at sediment provenance studies. So we're looking at um, the study of the sandstone composition as function of the source area that's been exposed, as well as the various uh, conditions um, that were present in um, uh, during the erosion and deposition of those uh, rocks. So what Dickinson did was is to build basically an empirical relationship between uh, the composition of sands, and so we see these ternary composition in a bit, and the plate tectonic setting. So uh, what is a particular setting that uh, can be associated with that particular composition? So that was the first quantitative uh, representation of uh, basically the concept of uh, sand provenance studies. So just a quick uh, recall about uh, provenance. Uh, so where does stuff come from? How do you get there? Uh, so we have a source area, uh, that's my pointer. We have a source area, there's weathering erosion breakage, uh, gets transported into a sedimentary basis, a basin uh, after which there's compaction, diagenesis, etc. 
Um, here's some nomenclature that was used by Dickinson. So a sandstone consisting of quartz, feldspar, and lithic uh, fragments. And so there are a number of uh, subcompositions there that a quartz has uh, two types of quartz, mono, crystalline, and polycrystalline quartz. In the feldspar, we have, of course, the plagiar clays and alkali feldspars, and then two types of lithic fragments. So we can make uh, a number of, of, of uh, ternary systems, and here is the system notation of those, uh, those various ternary systems. So for provenance studies, uh, we'll have um, three major ones and then a mixed one. Uh, so will be a colonial block, uh, magmatic art provenance, and uh, recycled origin provenance. So here is the, the Dickinson model. So Dickinson basically presented all this data into ternary diagrams um, and then sort of did a qualitative analysis by circling uh, the various areas uh, of provenance. So for example, here we have a continental block provenance, recycled origin provenance, um, et cetera. And this is the magmatic one. And so this would be in the uh, quartz feldspar lithic fragments. And so we can repeat this uh, basically for all these uh, ternary uh, diagrams. So another example of two ternary diagrams. And again, we see a somewhat uh, classification or decomposition, although here uh, we're looking more at uh, something that is um, like in the previous study, we're looking at uh, a compositional line within this uh, that may uh, basically represent some kind of process uh, that is present. So how can we now sort of this Dickinson model, which was, uh, it was quantitative, but at the same time, it was also qualitative in the sense that uh, the data was used uh, more for, for grouping by visualization. So can we create more quantitative discriminant functions and have some measure of confidence with that? Because maybe the regions that were drawn were not basically all that confident. Uh, some region may be more confident than other regions. So <clears throat> in the paper of Welch, then um, these samples were uh, revisited. Uh, so we had uh, basically uh, all the samples were averages, um, uh, and so uh, some uh, samples have more average, have more uh, some averages are calculated based on more samples, and so we have to worry about weighing as well by uh, the sample size. So we do uh, we'll see that we do log ratio analysis. In this case, we'll do ALR log ratio analysis and build uh, predictive models with that, and then see whether to what extent they compare with the Dickinson model. So this is actually the presentation of the summary of data by Dickinson uh, himself. Uh, so again, we have four ternary diagrams um, and we have a provenance, uh, provenance uh, re, uh, sort of um, resources. And so um, here we see, uh, first of all, we see, uh, for example, provenance uh, A, which was the continental block provenance. We see a high representation of quartz uh, less feldspar, et cetera, and, uh, and so on. For example, for, for province B, it's more equally distributed. And so what we're looking for is some kind of pattern uh, in these compositions and how these uh, compositions can explain these, these various uh, groups that are present. So if we would take the Dickinson model, and here are some regions that were drawn by Dickinson uh, just sort of uh, visually, uh, created linear lines within the ternary diagram. And um, and then, for example, here we notice that for A, uh, we have this uh, much more higher quartz, less lytic uh, fragments for B, even where we had sort of something more that was in the middle. And so if we can calculate log ratios, so here we calculate the log ratio of Q over F and Q over L, um, then, then we can actually translate this, um, these lines into, into these log ratio uh, type lines. And so these are the equivalent discriminant lines if Dickinson would have drawn them in the log ratio diagram. Uh, here's the same thing, uh, but then we have also the mixed uh, region. So the question is, okay, um, how good is this line? Um, how confident are we about this line, say, versus this line? And uh, does it really appear like this in a log ratio diagram, or is it more uh, is it different or more sophisticated? So the way that is done is then uh, is 
uh, plotting these um, log ratios. So here we're looking at the ALR uh, log ratios. And so when we transform uh, that information, uh, this is for one provenance. Uh, essentially, this is for provenance, I think provenance A, this is for B, and this is for C. Then what we get then um, are now, as you notice, uh, a particular spread of points that is much more linearly, or uh, it's much more distributed um, in, in, in what we would expect from, from data that is correlated. And so uh, what we can do now is um, fit basically distributions. In this case, we're fitting a multivariate normal distribution to all this data. Sometimes we have outliers, um, we have to account for those, and that's something we cover in the, in the next session. Uh, but as you notice, for this case at least, you got a pretty good fit to this uh, normal distribution. And so this normal distribution then looks uh, like this um, in, the, uh, in the ternary diagram. And again, we see a, a pretty good fit. So what we can then do is put it all together, and uh, we have here now uh, these three distributions that we saw in the previous slide, and uh, we can calculate discriminant region, uh, for example, uh, looking at the equidensity uh, lines that are present, and then so would be these lines here to, uh, that separate the regions. And so if we then go back into uh, the ternary diagram space, then we get this uh, this. Um, this particular ternary diagram. And so if you compare that indeed with uh, the Dickinson model, then um, that looks very similar, except perhaps here uh, in terms of feldspar, we see some difference uh, with the model as well as here. So uh, there are some differences that are showing up. Um, and so uh, this provides us perhaps which much more of a quantitative uh, assessment than the Dickinson model. So I think those two examples um, hopefully uh, show to you that this log ratio analysis um, allows us to transform data that exist in ternary diagrams, which are more difficult to interpret into log ratio space, where we get a much better understanding of the association between uh, log ratios and also to understand how these uh, variations that we observe in log ratios can be linked to certain geological processes that cause these relationships. And so um, in the soil example, we saw that the, the bedrock or the parent material was important, but also the, 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 also the redox and pH conditions uh, were important to understand um, the, the, the variation in data that we saw. And for the Dickinson model, we saw the same thing is where we see the compositional variation of sandstone uh, as it was related to the provenance. Um, in the Welch paper, the last example, um, that was published, I think, before um, ILR ratios uh, were developed. And so there we used ALR ratios. But in general, it's uh, if you do standard multivariate analysis, uh, such as discriminant analysis, it's better to work with ILR ratios uh, because of their ortho orthogonality and isometry uh, with the vector space.